And then lucky number 41. You did 41 visits? I need to count, but we were... Holy yeah. cow, Moya. Yeah. Are you serious? We saw a lot of apartments. How, how are you not losing your mind? Hi. The following is a conversation with Moya Mawini, a vlogger and artist based in Paris. We discussed the challenges and also the magic that comes with moving to a place like Paris. This was a different kind of podcast than what I have done in more recent times where we were actually having breakfast at the same time. So it was kind of like a come hang with us sort of experience. I would really like to know if you enjoy this more casual approach uh, or if you prefer the deeper, more philosophical conversations. Either way, I suggest you grab something to drink or partake in some sort of visually creative project like painting or drawing while you listen. Also, I will leave links to Moya's work in the show notes or the description if you're interested in checking it out. One more thing, actually, most of you are watching these podcast episodes on YouTube, but they are available anywhere that you can listen to podcasts. So just want to put that out there and the links to check it out elsewhere will be available in the show notes and description. All right, having said all of that, I hope you enjoy. Mm. It's just gonna be us eating. This is a very unique podcast episode. <laughs> um, mm. Okay, so you moved to Paris. I did. Officially. A few months ago. Mm -hmm. This isn't your first stint in Paris. It's not my first radio. I want to explore the reasons behind your move and why you've come here. Okay. And it's part of a long-standing tradition of foreigners coming here, wanting to make art or... You know, the romantic vision yeah. of Paris. Yeah. But it's also, it can be really miserable. Yeah. <laughs> but why? Like, from an outside perspective... Why it's suffer? Like, why do people put themselves through this, right? To struggle to find a tiny apartment that's very expensive, you know, in a big city, mm -hmm. right? What are the what are the things that brought you to Paris that make it worth it? Well, oh, we've started. Yeah, <laughs> diving in. But I mean, it's kind of the same in other big cities like New York and London. Right. Like you're going to get, you're going to be paying a lot for a small place. Right. But I think... The difficult thing is uh, the French paperwork. Yeah. Hurdles that you have to cross and jump over and fall over. A lot of falling over the hurdles. Yeah. Struggling. But we get back up and then we get there. Um, but why? Yeah, why? Why specifically Paris? So people ask me this um, in the whenever I've like met someone new, especially like Parisians, French people be like, okay, so like, why did you move here? Right. They're puzzled, um, right? Because a lot of, there's actually a lot of Parisians that love living here, but there's yeah. plenty that are also like, yeah. get me out of this place. And I think there's, there's multiple reasons. Um, but one of the main ones is, yeah, it has always been a dream of mine. Mm. I think when I first came here as a little girl and would go to the museums with my parents, I was looking at the architecture and I just fell in love with like the French language mm. and everything about it. And I was like, someday I'm going to live in one of those apartments. I'm going to be sitting on that balcony, having my little coffee and croissant. Um, and because I, I do have the flexibility to be able to work from wherever I want. I was like, what am I doing somewhere that isn't inspiring me? Yeah. Or like, I'm not super happy. Why don't I just move to Paris? So how old were you when you first felt that you were exposed to French culture, that you, this okay. idea about France began? I think the first time I came to Paris, I was maybe four. Oh, so wow. that might be a little bit too young. But it's like some of your earliest memories. Earliest memory. Um, earliest memory of my brother threatening to throw me off the Eiffel Tower. Oh my yeah. <laughs> God, that's a hilarious threat. And um, he denies it. How old were you? Say. That That was when I was four. And how old was he? He's two years older, he was six or something. <laughs> um, and yeah, I kind of remember like taking the stairs up to the Eiffel Tower and getting like major vertigo as well. Yeah. Probably also being carried by my dad. Like, yeah. There's no way I was walking up all those stairs as four. So you touched on a lot there. So the language interested mm -hmm. you? Mm -hmm. Was it just the sound of the language or? I think so. I think yeah. it's, it's so like romantic. Yeah. Um, and yeah, so I actually did French. A level 
for G- GCSE okay, gotcha. level, let's go. Not that you can really tell by my level of French at the moment. That was no. You speak many, excellent many, French. Many many years ago. <laughs> I think your French is coming along. I have a theory about this because it's it's interesting that you're a language man. I'm a language man. Yeah, and but there's something interesting about French culture because it's like it feels like it has reached more people in the world than a lot of cultures, if that makes sense. Like French culture seems to have a particular appeal. Um, or some people are, some people have strong negative feelings about France mm, as well. Right. Mm. It's not quite like Italy, Italy. It feels like is globally positive in my experience. I, I don't know a lot of people that are like, Oh, I hate Italy. Like, yeah, but there's, there's like a little bit more polarization going on with, with France. France and the French. And I found not always, but often people either love it or hate it here. Mm. And I think it's because the French are very, and the French way of life and French culture and the French language, it's very unique. Like it's very um, distinguished, you know, and there is that kind of romantic, elegant thing. The flip side of that is that some people interpret that as snobby, right? Yeah. So either that sings to you and you're like, oh my God, I love that. And I want more of that. And I want to immerse myself in that. Or you're like, cool. I don't like them. They're all stuck up or whatever. And I'm not yeah. interested. Do you agree with this theory? Um, I, Feel free I, to disagree. No, I, I, I understand where it comes from. And I've definitely heard people have a negative experience yeah. of Paris, especially. Um, but... No, I mean, well, one of the reasons I ended up moving to Paris, like, for good was because of some of the people that I met here. Because okay. I knew that I would have at least some sort of foundation mm. of people that I could reach out to and who were actually also French or Parisian. Mm. And because I didn't want to move here and just become friends with expats. <laughs> no, no. I just mean like, I damn. Because one of the I, one of the reasons I moved here was to learn the language yeah. and become fluent. So I wanted to make sure that I would also have a circle of yeah, like French friends. But th- there's a lot of interesting things you just said there. So first of I all, know. what I've realized we have so much to unpack. <laughs> a lot to unpack. So one of the first things I realized was I had a similar philosophy when I came to Paris. I was like, I'm not hanging out with Americans anymore. Ironically, I've never had more American friends. Really? Yeah, in my life. And what I've come to realize is that it's a different breed of person who makes the journey and goes through the bullshit, mm-hmm. <laughs> all of the obstacles and the headaches and just the complications that you're making to your life that you have to go through when you move abroad, right? For sure. Or move to Paris, right? And so what I found is I've in many ways been able to connect better Mm-hmm. With a lot of expats because of this, because there's that shared struggle, that bonding experience. I don't know if you've if you've had that, um, because I just I don't feel like I see Americans that have experience living abroad or live here, for example, the same way I see Americans that have like never left the United States. You oh, know, yeah. it's like no, it, no, it feels like two different nationalities almost. Yeah, yeah. Or and then there's the third nationality of Americans. Why are we talking about Americans? But the, <laughs> the ones who um, live in New York who. I don't know. I just feel like New Yorkers I can normally vibe with or people who've like lived in New York for a long time. Right. I feel like they're a different breed to them. Right. But yeah. Anyway, we're not talking about But do you that. think that's a big city thing? Um, yeah, I think it's a a big, yeah, the internationalness of a big city. Right. Like always having different people passing through and different cultures right. and yeah. But is it only at the level of world city? Because so you spent some time, you spent how many months in New York? Uh, probably like four. Okay. It was meant to be longer. Right. Sob story. But you've also lived for, I don't know how long exactly in Belfast. Okay. Well, I lived in Belfast my whole life. Your whole life. Okay. (laughs) Well, no, that's, that's bullshit. But my whole like childhood life until I was 18. Gotcha. And then I went to college in Dublin for four years. Okay. So we're talking different levels of big cities, right? Because it's like the biggest city. Yeah. Um, in each corresponding country, basically, Mm -hmm. I think. Well, actually, New York is probably, in terms of population, gosh, I don't know off the top of my head. I don't know. I don't think it has a bigger population than LA. But anyway, that's not the point. My point is you lived in different levels of bigger cities. Do you feel like it's a different breed of people that live in Belfast versus the rest of the country? Or... Well, in Northern Ireland? Yeah. 
Oh, Belfast is not a big city. Belfast is so small. Okay, so you don't feel the same applies to that? No. Okay, how about Dublin um, versus the rest? I mean, I, I guess so, but Dublin's still small too. I think Interesting. In, in, the, in the grand scheme of like Ireland, Dublin seems like a, a big city. Right. And it is because it's like the capital city. Um, but if you go from that to London or New York, like it's, it's incomparable right. in terms of like even in Dublin, it didn't feel super multicultural. Yeah. Um, Belfast, definitely not. Right. I just asked that because Paris is also not the same as the rest of France, yeah. right? Like I spent a year in the countryside during my exchange and people literally say bonjour no matter who you are as you walk past like everyone does that people don't do that in paris no i feel like you can make it what's interesting is if you i, I had developed that habit after my time on exchange so i brought that with me to paris and in the beginning when i first arrived here i was saying bonjour to everybody and it startles people but they will <laughs> respond they, because it's it's common it's like etiquette Polite to, it's yeah. polite. So you'll say bonjour, they'll be surprised, but they will respond with bonjour, which yeah. is funny. It's really hilarious to me. But it's not this, like the the default attitude is not the same in Paris versus the rest of the country, you know? Um, which is kind of interesting because we group people into nationalities, like Americans. But like mm. you said, n people in New York are not the same as people in <laughs> Nebraska or whatever. Nebraskans are cool. Yeah, I'm, I'm not saying they're not. <laughs> I'm just saying they're different. <laughs> okay, so what brought you here was some of that, The it was the language. It was the language. The people. People. The people came above, like the people was, uh, the, the connections that you had here was a stronger factor in bringing you to this place over the culture? Um, no, but it made me more comfortable for the move. Right. Like, um, it definitely solidified that I could do it. And, um, yeah, no, I mean, there's also, so I studied art history in college and for most of my final year, it was a focus in like 18th, 19th century French right. painting. Okay. So, I mean, you're talking all the grits are in part, yeah. like the best museums are here and they're free museums. Yeah. If you're European and under 26, even for um, like special exhibitions and stuff, mm -hmm. because in London museums are free for the public, but for exhibitions you have to pay like twenty or twenty pounds, right? Even if you're like a student, but here it's free. Yeah, I can just go into a museum anytime I want. But that's for right under twenty six or whatever. Yeah, yeah. So I want to make the most. So I was like, I got to move to Paris before I turn twenty six. Um, and at some point I feel like I can see myself applying for a master's in art history or, um, a fine arts mm. BA here. Um, and so for that, I would need to have the language. Mm. So first step. So an interesting criticism I have heard about Paris is mm. that it is a museum. Like that's it's, a criticism. Yeah, for some people, because it's it's not in the 21st century, if that makes sense. There's so much history and culture that took place in previous centuries that it's weighed down by that. I had a Mexican roommate who had a torrid time in uh, France and left with that criticism. He felt like, oh, they're just too, they're not innovating or moving forward. They're stuck in the past and in tradition. Do you, do you feel that at all? It seems like your immediate reaction seemed like not at all. <laughs> I guess I've never thought of it like yeah. that. I mean, maybe for people with different interests, that would be a criticism. Mm -hmm. But for someone like me, that's like why I'm drawn to it. Yeah. Like you're just walking through history every day. It's just interesting because it does seem like there was I mean, Paris still attracts a lot of artists, right? And a lot of interesting, creative, talented people. I've found that a lot of people come through here. Like a lot of yeah. my friends come through here. I don't have to go. We talked about this. I don't have to go see them necessarily. Mm -hmm. I like to do that as well. But people will come through Paris. So it's a chance to see them, even if they live in another country. Um, but not a lot of people stay. But okay. Yeah, yeah. that's interesting. It's a, I feel like it's a passerby city. Right. Um, especially for 
foreigners, if right. you know what I mean, like our friends and stuff. Right. Um, but I think that's because it's also the language aspect. Like yeah. if you're raised only speaking English, um, the idea of moving to a city with a different language is obviously so daunting. Yeah. And it is very difficult. Yeah. It's, yeah. And especially French people, most of the time, well, I know, I think older generations of French people um, will mostly just try to speak to you in French or get annoyed if you don't speak good French. Right. But I do think things are so much better with like younger French people. Yeah, definitely. But I was just going to say that like turn of the century, France, Paris had, was just an absolutely, it was an absolute explosion of culture and art, right? And so it's always relative, but it does seem like compared to that, you know, Paris is still this like symbol of art and culture, but there's like a, I don't know, it's an interesting philosophical question of the, the soul of the city, like if it is continuing to evolve and move forward. I think they're doing a pretty good job, you know? And I think I came here for that really rich history as well. And I feel like that feeds me in the things that I create now. I don't know why. I just feel like I step outside and I'm so inspired. Mm -hmm. And I don't feel that feeling of inspiration elsewhere. Mm. Um, I guess I have different inspiration elsewhere, if that makes sense. But yeah, this is yeah, like yeah. one of my favorite flavors. Yeah, it's you good. Know? Did you Like once you taste it, it's really hard to taste, to go somewhere else. But what is that? Let's Let's explore this. What is that delicious... French flavor. <laughs> I don't know, because like at the same time, I don't want to overly romanticize right. the city. But just talk about your perspective. And it's okay if it's romanticized because we're being self-aware and we know that that yeah. might be going on. Yeah. Here. And yeah. And I haven't been here for like super long. Right. So, you know, at some point, I'm sure my bubble is going to get burst. <laughs> well, I'm three years in and, and yeah, the rose colored, the rose tinted glasses come off. Mm hmm. So certain things don't have the same effect. I look at B-roll that I would film when I first got here and I'm like, yeah. that's really mundane. Like that's just, that's just a building. You know what I mean? <laughs> that's, that's my videos. <laughs> yeah. I literally, I'm just like, wow, it's just someone's apartment building. Yeah. But there's still something. There's still a magic that I still feel every time I step out of my building, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and there's like a, I don't know, visually I'm very impacted. I mean, the architecture is amazing. Yeah. And the regularity, I think, of this style is so satisfying when you're walking around. I yeah. don't know, there's, there's no other city like it that's been, I guess, designed and flipped by one person. Yeah. Um, but I think also one of the things I really love is that people still shop for specific things in specific shops, if you know what yeah. I mean. So, like, you have your boulangerie, you have your fromagerie. Right. Um, you have your place where you get your vegetables and stuff and it's just so nice. Like, it's just such a nice way of life. That was a really random tangent. No, I just, I no just I'm that. asking you for tangents right now. <laughs> I want to go into just the details of what makes okay. life here magical. Um, but well, I think f for me, it's also the aspect of, because I'm not fluent in French, even just spending a day walking around and doing mundane things I'm learning something mm -hmm. every day and it's a type of learning that's different to yeah sitting in a classroom right it's like you're able to absorb you know new vocabulary and right. like practice your listening and speaking and it's really exciting that at some point I'm gonna I'm gonna have another language I've always wanted to be fluent in two languages yeah it is so, so cool to be yeah. able to do that. It's one of my favorite things ever. Yeah. But you spent time in other places. You spent time in Indonesia. You spent mm -hmm. time, like months in Indonesia, in Italy. Mm -hmm. But you didn't, you, you still have like the foreign language thing going on there, right? Why is the commitment to Paris right now? Well, I think also the, the cross-section between art and fashion here is like nothing else. Right. And yeah, the fashion... The, the epicenter of fashion in the world is in Paris. And I'm not like fully into fashion, but it's just so cool to see things mm. happening. And um, actually I ended up having, being able to make really good connections 
for work here, which I didn't really get whilst I was in London, for example. Like Wow, interesting. I I don't know, just honestly, the the brands here have been more excited to work with me than brands in London. So I was like, well, if it's better for work, I want to learn the language. I love the city. Yeah. I can go to the museums every day. Yeah. But there's also so much culture in London. Was it just like a different kind of culture that spoke to you less? Or you or you've had that phase of your life and you're it's just not the fresh thing right now? Yeah, I guess so. I feel like London will always kind of feel like home, even though I've only lived there for like a year, but all my best friends are from London. And I'm so familiar with the city. And I could definitely, you know, see myself there mm. in the future. And maybe when I'm older. But it just wasn't exciting. For, it yeah. just wasn't new. Um, and I also, yeah, in terms of like work and stuff, right. I just wasn't inspired. And I don't know, I just didn't really know what direction I was going in. Yeah, I, I think I'm just fascinated by this because it's kind of easier to explain the American fascination with Paris. It's like... Mm -hmm cobblestone streets and the architecture and the language and whatnot, right? Because there's the continental divide, but you're not American. Like, do you feel, do you feel European or do you feel Irish or like, where do oh, the lines, where wow. are the lines drawn? So this is a lot, this is a lot to unpack because I, especially whilst I was in Indonesia, I was having full like identity crisis. Yeah. So because I was born in Belfast, <laughs> I was, I'm technically British and Irish. Right. Um, and Brexit definitely changed a lot of that. Brexit and going to university in Dublin definitely shifted my perspectives on how Irish I feel versus how British or like, and then there's like, I guess, Northern Irish. Right. But in what ways? It made you feel more Irish or yeah, less Irish? Okay. More. Um, because, I mean, I didn't grow up in a particularly pro-British environment, like at all. Interesting. Um, but I wasn't as exposed to Irish culture. Um, and what is that? Like, what were the things that, if you can give specific examples? Well, I, like, I didn't go to a Catholic school, right. so I didn't grow up with like speaking Irish or like learning Gaelic. Right. So yeah, so there's that, that dynamic. and But then there's also the my mom being Indonesian mm -hmm. dynamic. Um, so yeah, being mixed race, but also like having never lived in Indonesia. All that being said, I guess I feel European. So, but being European though, it's still, it's like, it's funny because it's like Paris feels like this foreign thing to you. Yeah. As a European major city, you know, that's the thing that I think is fa as fascinating to me about this continent. It's like, it's a continent and we call it Europe. Right. But it's like so many different things that are mm. packed together. Um, yeah. I mean, there's still countries I haven't been to in Europe. And there are definitely British people that I think would answer that they don't feel European, like that there's the there's yeah. a divide there. You know what I mean? Well, they did leave. Yeah. 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 They did. They did exit. Yeah. 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 Interesting. So, and do you feel your identity gets even more kind of mixed up in your head while you're here? Or mm -hmm. is it kind of a, because I felt like I had a chance to reinvent myself arriving here. Kind of. As in, I, I agree with that. The like reinvention thing. It definitely feels like a fresh start, which is so exciting. Yeah. And really nice. And I think I couldn't really build that fresh start in London because I, yeah, as I said, like a lot of my best friends are there already from college and then people from home were moving over. I couldn't really feel like I could make myself new in that city. Not that I, I wanted to like become a different person, but it just felt harder to grow yeah. individually whenever you have people from like home and stuff yeah. in your surroundings. Like, yeah. Isn't that so fascinating that when you're surrounded by people that knew kind of like a, a younger version of yourself and you're trying to you're trying to grow out of it or change or whatever, it can feel like you're being held back because their ideas of you. I don't know if that's what you're referring to, but that's what I kind felt. Kind of, yeah. But I mean, like, it's not that I didn't want to hang out 
with my friends because I miss them whilst I'm here. Um, I think I just find it hard to not do my own thing because I, w yeah, I don't know. You felt bad, like you were a bad friend? Because all my friends kind of would go, were going into like their post-grad jobs and nine to fives. Yeah. And I was here doing this other pass. Like right. it was, I didn't want to come across as like, oh, I have such a free schedule. Like, um, I can do this when I want to do this. And I didn't want to make them feel bad for that. And I also find it hard to. So it felt easier to begin a new chapter in a new place entirely. Yeah, kind of. I was like, you know what, let's just go somewhere else. <laughs> yeah. So you, um, you travel a lot and well, I feel like you travel a lot. I guess. Yeah. I think past year, I haven't had a bis in a year. Right. Okay. So I feel like it's fair to say you travel a lot. Yeah. Um, and you spend extended periods of time in different places, mm -hmm. right? Sometimes months. I found that challenging personally. And this was reflective of a particular period of my life. And I'm not sure it would be the same now. Like context continually changes, right? Mm -hmm. But I found it really difficult to keep feeling like I was starting back from zero. So I understand your point about it feeling a little more comfortable to come to Paris because you knew some people. Yeah. But have you felt like you've struggled a little bit with loneliness making these leaps? Because Oh, for sure. And I think especially like the Indonesia trip, that was because that was the longest solo stint that I'd done on my own. What did you do? You spent like two months there? Yeah, it was like two months, but... Like last fall? Yeah, yeah. from September to like November-ish. Um, and yeah, I had done a few months in Paris and then a few months in Florence. But like Florence, I was living with a friend, so it was always super social and right. in Paris as well. Yeah, a lot of people pass through the city, so... You normally, especially whenever summer comes around, there were a lot of people here that I knew. Right. And I had made some friends. Um, so in my head, I was like, oh, yeah, I can, like, do this solo travel thing. Like, I like this. But it wasn't actually, like, I wasn't alone all the time. Yeah. Um, whilst in Indonesia, for the first month, I was, like, very on my own. On my own doing, though, like, I chose not to stay in hostels and... I wanted to stay on my own and spend more time, you know, figuring out my identity and interesting. Um, just like also kind of switching off a bit. So you, it was a conscious decision. It was a conscious decision. I actually made a video about it where it wasn't the being alone that kind of freaked me out. It was more just like I was so whenever you're you. I didn't really have just distractions yeah. or like other people to, you know, do stuff with. And then so you end up getting very, very introspective. Yeah. And then you're like, oh, shit, like, what am I doing with my life? And that was the bit that I was like, oh, that's difficult. It is difficult. It's like when the noise levels go yeah. down, mm -hmm. you start to hear more of what's going on inside mm -hmm. of you. That was probably always there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it can really be freaky. I, yeah. I, I, I think it's really important and valuable, but it's also scary. And I understand why so many people don't do it. Yeah. You know, but was there something that prompted this? Because that's not an extremely common thing for people to do because of how uncomfortable it is. Was it just like, was this brought forth by something? I mean, not particularly. I I guess when I, I left London... In April, so I left my apartment there and like packed up, and then I was doing a few months in different places in Europe. And it got to autumn, and I had kind of figured out that I wanted to move to Paris at some point. Yeah. Um. Oh no, you know what? I I just find really cheap flights to Indonesia. Oh okay. Um. So and I a spontaneous trip. And I booked it. Yeah, in May. Um. So I had the flights booked, so I knew I was going. So was it more of a situation of like, you just found yourself there and it turned into an introspective? Yeah, kind of. Yeah, interesting. And also I was going to visit family um, and see my my Oma, so my Indonesian grandmother, who I haven't seen in like 10 years. Yeah, wow. And there was a period like last year where she was quite sick. So my mom was like, okay, obviously if you're in Indonesia, you have to go see her. Yeah. Um, so it was also like a family trip. As in, yeah, for me to see my family. Yeah. 
it sounds like you came to certain realizations or I don't know. It seems like you, you got some takeaways from this time there. Is that fair to say? Yes. And I know you're probably going to ask me what they were, but like, I really <laughs> can't. I feel like I'd need to like really sit on it yeah. for a bit. I guess I just think it's fascinating because another thought I had when you were sharing that was like, wow, that feels like such an important piece of the journey into adulthood too. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I'm now framing potentially a, an answer from you, but it made me think that you at some level do have to spend time alone to figure out your opinions on stuff, right? Yeah. Up to a certain point, you always can rely on like your parents' political ideas or whatever, because they've been talking about it throughout all of your childhood mm -hmm. or, you know, people, people all around you will say things, right? And you can kind of just let that be your opinions. But then like at some point in the journey to becoming an adult, I feel like you need to question a lot of that stuff to make sure, do you actually believe it or not? Right. I don't know if any of that was going on, but it kind of sparked that thought for me. It was more about like personal dynamics and like familial mm -hmm. dynamics that I learned a lot. So my mom ended up coming out to Jakarta um, whilst I was um, visiting my Oma. So we stayed in like the nursing home and stuff together. And that was like spending that much time with my mum because we couldn't leave the nursing home because of like COVID like rules and stuff right. and there's no Wi-Fi. So we were just Whoa. like <laughs> in a room with my Oma. He's just like chilling yeah. on the bed um, for like eight hours a day. And then we like go to bed, um, cook some food that's in the complete wrong order, kick some food and then go to bed. <laughs> and we were just doing that for like a week straight. Um, but I, it was such a nice time with my mom. Like I learned so much about her relationship with the country and her upbringing. And she was, she was sharing some stuff that she had never shared with me before. And it was like, it was like a therapy session, like that, wow. that trip. Like, so I feel like that was the most important part of my like Indonesia stint. That's and amazing. I think it is interesting how the conversations you can have with your parents as you become an adult change. For sure, for sure. It's kind of fun if you have a good relationship yeah. with them, right? It's like no, you I see them in a completely God, different light. I feel so lucky to have such amazing parents. And even with like the Paris move, part of it is inspired by my parents because when they were my age, maybe like a year older, they moved to Germany, to Hamburg, with, what, well, one suitcase, my dad's saxophone, no language, no job, no money, wow. no apartment, and just rocked up in the city. Who are your parents? <laughs> um, and I think they stayed in Hamburg for maybe four or five years. Yeah. And from what I've heard, it just seems like they had the best time. And they're like fluent in German now. They have German friends. They were able to build a wow. life here. And I really wanted to do something like that for myself. And they were so excited when I like told them, I was like, yeah, I definitely think I'm going to do the Paris thing. And they've been so excited for me this whole time, more so than they were for, for me to do anything, mm -hmm. um, which makes me feel really good about it. And... Yeah, like they're just so cool. Wow. So is your mom very, like, does she feel very connected still with Indonesia or? No, no? Not, not at all. Interesting. Does she, like, obviously you can't answer this on her behalf, but like, does her relationship with Europe and Indonesia and whatnot, did that, was that kind of what had you thinking a lot about your own identity while you were spending time there? I guess so. Um, because... Well, she moved to Belfast when she was like 15. Mm. Um, and yeah, has been in Belfast ever since, apart from when my when they went to Hamburg. Um, and when she was growing up, she actually spent a lot of her school years in Malaysia. So when we were like having conversations in Indonesia and she was telling me more about her child and stuff, I actually realized she didn't spend that much time in Indonesia. Interesting. Um, and she would speak Malaysian with her friends. And yeah, so like even in terms of language and stuff, I mean, she is fluent in Indonesian, but she didn't raise me speaking it. 
So it kind of made a lot more sense of, for her disconnect to the country. And yeah, there's also some like n negative stuff um, that I think she just associates with the place. And yeah, Indonesia's mad sometimes. It's really interesting you said that because uh, like I'm obviously mapping some of the stuff you're saying to my own life, which mm -hmm. is kind of, isn't that funny how conversation works? Like you'll listen to stuff that has nothing to do with you, but you'll think about how it applies to you. That's what's so great about humans. Yeah. Like your people's abilities to connect. Yeah. And ref what is, I don't know, not like, I feel like there's a nicer way of saying bounce off, but yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it just that made me think about how my parents have their own kind of not entirely positive relationship with Argentina. Like mm -hmm. there's there's things that they I would say love and appreciate. Mm -hmm. Um but there are definitely societal or cultural things that they don't feel connected to at all. And so it's weird that the multicultural thing now has like passed on from generation to generation. It's like, what am I? Because already it's funny, I, there was a point where I was more pro-Argentinian than they were. And they're like, go spend some time over there. And and then I went that's, and I that's saw like... what my mom was like. Really? Yeah, because, yeah, I went to... A few years back, I went to Bali with my now ex-boyfriend. And my mom was like, really? You're going to... You want to go to Indonesia? And I was like, yeah, I want to go to Indonesia. Um, and even whenever I booked the flights... Um, she was like, you're going to spend a month there, like on your own. Wow. Um, so didn't she think it was good for you to like, r at least check it out for yourself? Uh, yeah, no, I think so. But I think she just, yeah, doesn't, I think she just has a lot of issues with the place and like f family traumas and stuff that yeah. like she doesn't want to unpack there. Yeah. Um, gotcha. But yeah, and yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I that goes back to the point of moving to a new place can be this incredible way to reset because it can be difficult to shake mm -hmm. some of that stuff off for sure. So who's Moya in Paris then? Is this like a new, this is like the Moya that takes the next step with her artistic career? Because I know you paint, oh, so. you draw. You were already doing a lot of this stuff coming in you know, yeah. to Paris, but it seems like you want to take it up a step. I do, but it's hard because it's the thing I've always wanted to do. And you know, whenever you have that thing and you're just like, it's so scary to do the, to do the thing that you always wanted to do. What do you think that is? Like, do you think it's like a, um, well, it's cause you're, it's the thing you actually care about. So you're so afraid of failing and it, and if it fails, then, right. then your whole, idea of yourself is in kind of fact yeah i mean that's a bit dramatic but it's like a fear of failure it's a fear of failure like and you're I, gonna be bad at this yeah and i think also growing up art was probably the thing that people would be like whoa you're actually really good at that and like that stuff sticks to you whenever you're a kid like if you get told you're good at something your identity you, you, gets wrapped yeah, up in it you associate yourself with being good at that and and now it's like a oh, god i have to prove myself yeah. Wow. Interesting. So do you find yourself avoiding it in some ways? Because mm -hmm. really, mm -hmm. wow, that, that hits different. I got to yeah. say, I feel like I can relate when it comes to writing. Like I write a lot already as mm -hmm. is, but I just have this idea that I'm going to be an author. You know what I mean? Yeah. But it's like, the pressure to write a really good book. Yeah. I'm going to be a painter, <laughs> but I have not painted anything really since I've been here. Right. And a lot of it is obviously practice. Like you need to be practicing in order to improve. Yeah. But I think actually one of the things which is quite unusual is because I share my life on social media um, or like on YouTube and stuff is that taking people along with that process, I don't want to show them the shitty bits at the start whenever things, oh, yeah. whenever I'm not making good things. Yeah. And and I know, like, I would never think that watching someone else's content. Like, I'd be like, whoa, it's really cool to see them improve and, yeah. you know, navigate that. But the perfectionist in me only wants to 
start sharing that side of myself whenever I like I'm part of the things I'm creating. Totally. Totally. There's something really interesting about the amount of feedback that you get that can sometimes derail you. Mm, mm -hmm. I, it's funny, like <clears throat> this is a weird example, but I shared a screenshot of a run that I went on recently and it included my heart rate, which looked kind of on the high side based off of like, um, calculations that you generally make, but I was doing further research on the internet. So basically some people left comments going, your heart rate looks high. Like be, keep, you pay attention to that, you know, like keep an eye on that. I was like, uh Oh, what? That's weird. Cause I felt fine on the run. Yeah. Right? And I was doing research and there's like ways to calculate what a good heart rate is and whatnot. And then I was digging a little bit deeper and there's runners where, you know, in forums saying, look, I have a heart rate when I run that should technically mean I'm like, it's going to explode and I'm going to die. Right. But I feel completely fine. So, so I think there's some imperfections in how it's calculated. But the point of that whole anecdote is that a couple of comments from people completely threw me off and made me very self-conscious about a thing For sure. I was doing perfectly fine yeah. up until that point. Yeah. And I no. totally feel you on, especially with art too. It's like, sometimes you can be very attached to it. You're like, this yeah. is my baby that I'm yeah. making, which is probably not a great attitude. No, I mean, but it is. But the thing too, with making things, I feel this very strongly with paintings and with writing and with making videos. I think this is, this applies to all creative endeavors is that it's like, in, in some ways it's really ugly until it's beautiful, if that makes sense. Like it's yeah. really, it's really like not, it doesn't exist. It doesn't work until the last 10% where it's like, it's coming to life, you know? And that's what makes it really difficult to share the process or getting there because it's like, we're not there yet. You know, this is the process yeah. of me figuring this out. Yeah. Right. So how do you plan to navigate this? Not share until. I guess so. But then one of the other really good things about sharing things online is the accountability. Yeah. Um, like, I feel like if I sat down, switch on the camera and be like, okay, hey guys, I'm going to paint once a week. And I posted that and any subscriber who was watching knew that I was then going to be painting once a week. I'd right. be like, shit, I actually got to do it, yeah. which is nice because sometimes I'm very badly disciplined. Like I... Really? Yeah. And... On certain things, because you seem pretty disciplined in other regards. You were running a YouTube channel while going to school and... Well, no, but that's post-college. post Post-college, post -college it all fell post -college, apart. Post-college, all fell apart because I... I I str thrive, strive. I thrive in a very, um, in like the typical academic structure right. and routine. And whenever that disappeared, I realized that like, oh, I'm actually really, I'm kind of flailing a little yeah. bit. Yeah. And I do hold myself to a high standard. So the process of figuring out your own schedule has been a challenge. Mm -hmm. No, for sure. Yeah, I feel you, especially when it's so free form and you're like, I'm my own boss. I, you know, yeah. I have to figure things out. And I think I actually, I work better if I'm really, really busy. And I think that's why I was fine in final year of college to be able to, wow. you know, do final year, have a social life. You just don't have the, you don't have space uh, to just futz around. Is that what that is? Or Because I didn't have any space to, to chill. Or if I did have time, then it would be filled like, yeah, socializing. So interesting. But, um, I don't like it when I'm really, really busy. It feels like I'm a kind of a, a car, like, like an old, old <laughs> car where if I go too fast, like the wheels will fall off or whatever. Mm. You know what I mean? Like it, it feels, um, I quickly revert to stress and then busyness becomes untenable. Yeah. So you don't yeah. have the same reaction. Well, I mean, no, maybe, but maybe I kind of thrive in that level of stress whilst yeah no I just need to I need just need to like put myself in a routine of something and like I think that's why yeah finding a good art class art teacher here yeah. to at least give me some structure to that area of my life yeah. because I don't have the discipline to be like okay sit down and draw for like three hours right, right, right. um yeah but having a home base is going to help too and you haven't had that oh my god I just feel like oh, the biggest sigh, like the, I, <laughs> you yeah, get so excited I'm every time so, this comes up. I'm so excited. So what happened basically like you, so for people listening, I mean, they'll probably know by the time we, this comes out, but 
you've been looking for an apartment for two months and then and then lucky number 41 you did 41 visits i need to count but we were holy yeah. cow moya yeah. are you serious we saw a lot of apartments how how are you not losing your mind i was losing my mind but i kept it together somehow wow. um i but okay i think i applied maybe for about 20 25 of them the amount of work i know jeez so were there po points for first of all congrats on finding a place oh yeah and then i found one <laughs> that's amazing that's amazing but were there moments along the way where you were like what the hell am i doing is this like questioning the whole thing yes but like i always knew that it was going to work yeah. out it was just gonna take longer than i expected so there was no scenario where you weren't staying in paris no the only thing that threw me off was that i had pre-booked flights to la <laughs> and so then that meant that i wouldn't be in the city for like two weeks yeah and i thought that i would have my shit together way before right me going on that trip and then as it got closer to that point um i was like okay that will completely throw me off because i'll have nowhere to put yeah. my stuff i won't be able to look at apartments for two weeks um, but I do feel very lucky that I have lovely friends in Paris who were also able allowing me to sublet mm. <laughs> <laughs> because yeah, I, that, that stress wasn't as high yeah. as it probably is for other people. No, that's amazing. Yeah. I didn't have that when I was looking for this place. Mm -hmm. And so I was eating shit staying at Airbnbs that were so overpriced. Oh my God. Either it's crazy how expensive Paris can be. Hundreds of dollars a night. Yeah. It's just completely unsustainable. Yeah. I was just like, I can't keep doing this. I can't keep doing this. Um, so I understand that Paris is very unfriendly in that way. Mm. It's interesting. Paris is, I feel this about the world in general, but it's like the world seems to be a reflection of your internal state. Paris, in my opinion, is a really unfriendly place. Um, if you have a really crappy situation, like living situation or dynamic, this gives, and I say this with empathy for people that are struggling or, you know, don't have things sorted out. And it's also a, just sublime when you have a lot of those things sorted out. And it's kind of incredible that it's two different worlds. You know, the, I've had periods over the three years that I've been here where Paris was not a good place, <laughs> you know, and I'm very fortunate and very lucky to be in the situation I'm in now, but it's stunning to me that a city, for example, can be such different things for such different people, you know, or people in different, in such different situations, I should say. But it's great that you didn't question it and you made it through that period because... It's just felt right, like the whole time. Like even, okay, maybe once we got to like week seven of that two month process, week six, seven, I was getting a little bit stressed, a little bit anxious, but... The first month and a bit, I was still so happy to be here. The honeymoon phase. Of getting yeah, there. yeah. And even like, okay, I get rejected from places that, you know, I wanted yeah. and I was also more than qualified to have. Right. Um, but I'd be like, okay, that's fine. You know, pick ourselves back up. And everything else in Paris was working out. So I was like, you know, the apartment will come Yeah. in due time. What's your advice to anyone looking for an apartment in Paris? Well, I used Garant Me to get... Did that work? Yeah. Garant Me, okay, yeah. Um, it's annoying because y you do have to pay a little bit yeah. extra. Basically, Garant Me is a website. That this can, is not sponsored. That, yeah, I know. So I'm going to ask them to sponsor you a should. video because... You should. Yeah. <laughs> they, um, they act as a guarantor, which is a requirement to get an apartment mm -hmm. in Paris. Yeah. Or anywhere in France, I think. And the thing was, when I moved to Paris uh, in January... Everyone I knew was either not French or the French ones were also freelancers. So they couldn't be my guarantors. Yeah. So yeah, guarant me was the best option. And I'd say maybe like 50% of agencies know about them. Actually, no, more than that. I think a lot of the agencies and agents that I talked to um, knew guarant me and had worked with them before and yeah. said it was completely fine. Some private landlords 
wouldn't know what it was. Yeah. Especially the older ones and would not care. Like, they'd just be like, well, you don't have a French guarantor, so you're not getting it. Right. Um, so, yeah, look into Garmi. Um, make sure, yeah, you have a sublet for, <laughs> I mean... You do need to have some sort of short-term solution. Yeah. And it needs to be more than a few days. Like, well, you need probably yeah. weeks. I told Damon initially that I was like, yeah, I'd love to stay in your place. Me for like two weeks. And he was like, well, you know, I'm gone for a month-ish. So, you know, if you need it, it's there. You're talking to the perfect person who's never here in Paris. So. Yeah, no, literally. No, I, I was very, very lucky that he was on his book tour as well at the same time. And then so two weeks roll by and I'm like, hi, Zuman. <laughs> we still don't have an apartment. Yeah. Can I stay? And he was like, yeah, of course. Um, but yeah, I thought I would get it in two weeks. But also I did... I had options in the first two weeks. I just turned them down. Right. You were picky. I was picky. Like there was two apartments. Two of the first apartments I looked at were like, you can take it if you want. Yeah. Uh, so. Good I for you though, to, for having the standards because you're going to hold on to this thing probably for dear life. So. Oh, I am so excited. <laughs> yeah. And we move in today. That's why I'm, I'm all giddy. Oh, that's so exciting. Yeah. There's, there's a real high that comes with moving into a new place. Yeah. On the flip side, like, what are the things that you hate the most about that hates a strong word, but the things that you dislike or hate, honestly, about being here? Because we've remind, we talked about the romantic side, how beautiful it is, the language, the culture, art. But are there things that you're just like, ooh, tough question. And I know there's definitely, I know you're very self-aware and you're like, well, I'm a foreigner that just came here, so it's not my place to criticize. I feel like that's probably what's running through your head. I guess so. I think I, I also am like a positive person. Yeah. I don't like to dwell on negative things. Okay, let me let me reframe it. Are there things that you feel you really struggle with in terms of the way of life here? Not necessarily that you hate them, but just that are challenging for you to adapt to so far. And that isn't related to searching for an apartment? Could be related to that. I mean, that was... I mean, that whole obstacle. process. Yeah. yeah. The paperwork. Yeah. Um, you know, what? actually, I can't think of anything. Really? Oh, I, you're deep in the honeymoon phase still. I'm in love. <laughs> the, well, okay, the trash, the whole trash situation was a bit ridiculous. Okay, well, yeah, it's still ongoing, especially ongoing. on the other side of the river. Yeah. Um, I mean, yeah, that whole s side of things, but, you know... People want to protest, I should protest, but don't, I don't know. I'm not going to offer any political opinions in this. I've heard that um, everything that's going on with um, like the protests relating to the changes in um, like the retirement age here in France, which is what's going on right now, that's making the news in the United States. And I was like, wow, that's, really? yeah. Yeah. I think there's a, an American fascination for some of this stuff too, you know, because the French are decidedly not doing the same thing. And there's plenty of Americans that also uh, don't don't like the approach in the U.S. where it's it's pretty far in the other direction, you know, where, I mean, I've grown up with the attitude, there will be no money for me, you know, in terms of social security and whatnot by the time I'm that age, right? Um, and it's just... There's, there's less safeguards, you know? So it's, it's kind of, I observe with fascination what's going on here because it's such a different attitude and perspective and they do pay higher taxes, right? Mm -hmm. um, I actually had a interesting conversation. I went to the bank yesterday. I have a, so getting a bank account set up as a foreigner in Paris. But you had an easy time with that. Well, no, I'm about to, I'm about okay. to talk about that. Is apparently meant to be really difficult. Yes, it is. It took and me a year and a half. That's ridiculous. And there was this apartment, which I was so close to getting. This is the, the, this was my grip. And the agent had texted me being like, well, you don't have a French bank account. Um, and I was like, no, I do. At that point, I did not obviously have a French bank account. So I texted her. I was like, yeah, I have it. I'll send you the number like this afternoon, knowing that, you know, other people had told me how hard it is as a foreigner to set up a bank account. 
ran to every single bank that I could find. I went to HSBC first because I was like, okay, international. Yeah. And they were like, yeah, it's going to take a few days. Like, you need to send in your paperwork. And then across the street, there was Credit Agricole. Mm -hmm. Went in and I just had the most lovely experience with this lovely, lovely man who helped me and set up the bank account right there and then. That's incredible. So, yeah, big shout out to Patrice. Um, go Patrice. Go Patrice. Anyway, so I was there yesterday to like sort out adding, adding, sending um, rent and stuff. Um, and yeah, he was he was like, oh, so you still want to stay in Paris, you know, despite like everything that's going on. And, you know, I think it's really cool that you, you want to stay here long term because I was telling him that my lease is for three years. Um, and I was asking him like what he thought and stuff about all the protests and if he was protesting. And to be fair, this conversation was happening in French. So I'm not quite sure what his viewpoint on it was. Okay. <laughs> but the general gist that I got was he wasn't protesting. He was kind of like, you know, if the age increases, then I'll yeah. just work longer and... That was his right. stance on it. But I I think he was talking about how it's different if you have like an office job versus yeah. manual labor. <clears throat> right. Anyway, that was a major tangent. I just want to, he was a great, he's a great guy. No, but I like, I kind of like that answer because it's like my starting perspective on this, them moving the retirement age from 62 to 64. My original attitude was, this is a little bit silly. Like I had a bit of like a judgment, you know, because I, Again, coming from the U.S., retirement age is older. I think it's like 67, 68. But again, even then, I don't, I do not expect to have like a safety net by that age, right? Mm -hmm. So, I, but also that's a reflection of the the work that I do, freelancing and kind of being my own boss and whatnot, right? Um, and my my parents who were immigrants, and you you couldn't count on like you you. You worked for, you know, everything that you had, right? But I'm realizing that there is no right and wrong here. And that is kind of what has led to the more, the perspective of curiosity about all of this, because it is it is a genuinely different perspective with valid points. You know, like I said, the point about them paying taxes and there's something nice about how there's a push against, I guess, the the capitalistic, the other end of the spectrum, which is like, we don't want to just live to work, you know? Yeah. Well, um, I think also it's the fact that Macron passed it without it being... He had to kind of brute force it. Yeah. Yeah. Which... But at the same time, there's the argument where people are living longer now and there's less workers per person in retirement age. Yeah. The world's changing. I know, so I think. At this point, it's kind of like a big question mark for me to see how things evolve. Yeah. Because all the, at the same time of all of this happening, AI and technology are advancing. And <laughs> before we started recording, Nathaniel was like, I've been thinking a lot about AI. Oh my God. I, how and can you I, not? And I was like, oh, I don't really have any thoughts on that at the moment. And now you're going to start talking about it. No, no. I okay. I'll just keep this point <laughs> brief. My point is just that everything is changing. Work, yeah. our idea of work is changing because, you know, if we have these ultra powerful tools that exist that can do so many of the things that we think of as work mm -hmm. right now, we're going to have to collectively change our perspective on this. And um, all of a sudden, these assumptions that I, that I had about work, like, oh, you need to work until your 60s or whatever, maybe that can change, you know? because the world is changing so quickly. I don't know. I don't know what's going to happen. But basically, I think that this is a lot more, it's it's very nuanced and very interesting to see. Um, so yeah, that's that was a giant tangent that right there. That was a huge tangent. <laughs> okay, let's see. Let's see if we can pull this back around to Paris. Are there th other things that you'd like to say about Paris? Um things that have struck you or inspired you or surprised you upon moving here? Well, I'm surprised. Well, no, I think people are surprised whenever I say that uh, French people are friendly and I've actually found it to be a very, very friendly city. Yeah. 
Um, I think it's because French people aren't fake. So, right. you know, they'll, they'll be blunt with you. And if they don't like you, they might not talk to you. Right. But if they do like you, that means you know that they actually like you, which is really refreshing. And I really appreciate that kind of honesty, yeah. especially whenever you do first move to a place and you are meeting people for the first time. It's nice to know that, you know, that person, we actually do vibe or that person, we're never going to be friends. It's quite easy, you know? So that surprised you how friendly it was? So you even bought into the stereotype that they're unfriendly here? Well, no, I think whenever I tell people that, you know, French people are friendly, they're surprised by yeah. me saying that. Um, but you know what I think is going on? I think you make an effort to speak the language and you make an effort to understand the people here. And yes. I think that we mistake things we don't understand with, oh, that's their mean or whatever. For sure. And... I feel very fortunate to have been brought into French circles here. And I kind of forget that there is probably a parallel social circle of Americans or expats that exist in Paris who don't have yeah. that dynamic. And when I went to, yeah, so I was, I was telling Nathaniel, I went to a life drawing class at the weekend and there were some American girls and I overheard them talking about how they haven't spoken to any French people That's and sad. that they, but like in a way that like, oh yeah, no, they're, they just keep to themselves. Like, but I'm like, you, well, you're not exactly trying. Yeah. Um, and even if you're not fluent in the language, like I'm not fluent in language. Sometimes I sit at drinks with friends and I can understand like a few sentences that they say. Yeah. I also find that there's a way to more easily interact with people by changing your own energy. Mm. You know, last night you saw me leave, uh, go on a little photo walk and I took my camera and I just walked around and was observing people and taking photos. And naturally that sparks interactions. Like someone saw me observing a bunch of stuff that was left on the street. You know how like when someone's moving out of an apartment or doing mm -hmm. renovations, you'll see like a bunch of crap on the sidewalk. Yeah. And I just found that fascinating because you're seeing a snapshot of their life. And it's such a common thing to see here in Paris. And then they come in and clean it up, yeah. right? But he, he was like, you find that be, like artistically beautiful? Because he <laughs> saw that I was like observing it with my yeah. camera. And I was like, and I gave him that answer. I was like, this is a snapshot of day-to-day -day life here. And here I am talking with this dude I don't know, you know? Um, I feel like there's, it just struck me that Yes, we live in a very digital world and things have changed so much. But before the phones, before the internet, this is how people did it, you know? Yeah. And it's still doable. It's still doable. You know, whether you go to a bar and you're having drinks or whatever, or you're just walking somewhere. And what I love about Paris and like French culture is, so like terrace culture and cafe culture yeah. where you, even when it's whatever amount of degrees outside, it's cold. Yeah. People will sit outside, they'll have their dinner, they'll like drink and smoke. But um, I've been on terraces where I'm either on my own or I'm like with a friend. And at some point you'll just naturally start talking to the people beside yeah. you. And it's so nice. Yeah. Like Because the space is so, people are so packed. Yeah, yeah. Like my friend Keen was visiting and I took him to one of my favorite spots, Cafe de la Poste in the Marais. It's very cute and we were having dinner outside and there's this really cool gay couple beside us who had this really sick dog and they were having their own dinner and then after a while the dog was like coming over and you know saying hi and um I started being like oh your dog is so cute like in French and then they just sparked conversation like through that and they're telling us about what they do in Paris and where they live and at that point I was still apartment hunting they were giving me advice on neighborhoods yeah it's just like yeah. it's the friendliness and openness yeah because of yeah that culture of yeah sitting outside and eating dinner together yeah I love that so about nice. Paris it's very epicurean you know, it's like people are sitting and enjoying themselves. They set a lot of time aside for enjoying yourself, which creates room for these mm -hmm. sorts of interactions, I think. Leisurely lunches, yeah. the whole August off. Dinners are Dinners. long too, you know. Weekends, proper weekends. Proper weekends. You don't yeah. email on the weekend. You don't email no. on the weekend. Do not expect no. any responses from anyone on I the was, weekend. I was emailing the agent of this apartment 
like all weekend <laughs> and I was getting no replies like fair enough Hard she's off, off yeah whatever it is 6 p.m on Friday yeah. I'll see you on Monday yeah yeah but that's nice that's nice and I feel like it's very difficult for me to disconnect from my work but it's helpful to be in an environment where that's encouraged it's mm -hmm, like mm -hmm. look everyone else yeah. is having their weekend you know life's not about work yeah well I think yeah, I agree. Yeah. I think there's, it's interesting because there's like a, I do like to care a lot about my work and it brings a lot of meaning into my life. But yeah, I don't want to be working 24 seven. Definitely. So cool. I think that's a good, that's a good stopping point. Okay. We covered a lot of topics here. I feel like I was all over the place a little. You know what? It was a meandering conversation. Yeah. It was coffee time with Nathaniel Moya. Yeah, exactly. You know, this was just chill. It was like a... It was like a, a typical conversation I feel like I would have with a friend about exactly. Paris. Life at the moment. Life at the moment, yeah. It's exactly. like a FaceTime with us. Yeah. <laughs> thanks, for, uh, thanks for doing this with me. I really appreciate it. Thank you for having me. We finally did it. Yeah, we've been talking about doing this for quite a while. I know, I know. But it's fun. I like doing this kind of stuff. Cool. I actually quite like talking. Yeah, this was, this is, um, it's always fun to, to kind of develop ideas as you're, as you're thinking out loud. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes I feel like I'll say something where I feel very solid about it and you'll have a reaction like, really? And I'm like, oh shit, I have to rethink this. Yeah, apparently, well, actually I know for a fact. Um, uh oh, what's about the, what do you Oh no, say? no, just that um, I have very distinct facial expressions. Oh, so do I, <laughs> so, right? Yeah, I guess so. so. I think people can react to that. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Wait, yeah. what's going on? Yeah. No, you're a very fast reactor to my facial expressions. Yeah. You're like, something's wrong. <laughs> what did I say? <laughs> I also, I think I pick up, if someone's laughing, I want to know why they're laughing. You know what I mean? Like if someone starts giggling halfway through answering something and I don't know what it's about, yeah. I will stop the conversation and be like, wait, so what happened? <laughs> you know? um, and some people don't like answering. They're like, oh, it was just... I just thought of something or whatever. So laughing at you. Yeah, probably. Yeah. Probably. That's probably. If they're not so answering. Loud. No, I'm kidding. Could be that. It could be that. Okay, cool. Well, thanks again. That was a conversation with Moya. Like I said at the beginning of this episode, I will leave links to her work if you're interested in checking it out in the show notes or description. I'm also going to leave a link to my newsletter, which is free and is a way for me to share little bits of inspiration from across the internet about once a month. And having said all of that, thank you for listening.